I want you to open to Psalm 24. And I say this as the Lord is my witness, standing here this morning, the text I'm about to read, I, I got it in my dream this morning. And I ran forward, seriously speaking, honestly, and certain things happen. Uh, I threw out that, and I'm believing God. I know that the word for somebody gave me, not before all of us, and I wrestled with just sticking with this or doing what I wanted to do. When I got this test this morning, and I decided to say, Lord, and I, instead of praying, and I'm for praying, praying, trying to get a word that will fit in in relation to what the Lord just showed me. I believe the Holy Spirit gave me that. And I just want you to just follow me briefly this morning. Uh, if you have your Bible, can you open to Psalm 24 and the, from verse 1? The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floors. Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Now pause here to say this to somebody here and to all of us. A relationship is a choice. And I know that based on a lot of things that is going on today in the world, uh, about <coughs> eternity, about God, and about heaven, and about hell, <coughs> about righteousness, about sin, about holiness, and all that debate and becoming where life and the modern day, everything is relative and is your truth. Again, the truth is that life is a choice. Worshiping God in truth and spirit is a choice. I've never seen anywhere in the scriptures where God is forcing or has ever forced anybody to serve him. Have you ever read anywhere where God is forcing people to follow him? God has never forced anybody to live holy. God has never forced anybody to live righteous. God has never forced and will not force any man to believe in the infallible word of God that is able to save your soul. Living right is a choice, and living wrong is a choice. Living for God is a choice, and living without God is a choice. And I think the earlier we settle that in our lives, the better for every one of us, because we think that it's something that I have to be compelled to do. You can't compel anybody to live holy. You can't compel anyone to live right. Even God does not do that. It's a choice. And so he said, who shall ascend unto the hills of the Lord? Here's the question. Who shall ascend unto his holy place? Who will? Not that you must. He said, who will? Who is willing to take the plunge? Who is willing to make the choice? Who is willing to make that decision? Whosoever will, let him come, see as the Spirit of the Lord. And he said, what? And he said, he that has a clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and the righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is a generation. This is where my heart is for six. This is a generation of day that seek him. Thy seek thy face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be thou lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Who is, lift up your heads, O ye gates, even be thou lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts is the King of glory. This morning, and as I told you this morning, I was reading that scripture and praying in, in the church, and it is in our church, and we were having communion, and some dangerous things began to happen. And I want to see that I'm believing God, you know, and somebody was just supernaturally, and I say this before I go into my note, as God is my witness. And somebody was supernaturally delivered. You know, he was all mangled up with 
the blood all over him and he came trying to attack and the, the intention was to upset the, the move of God or what God was trying to do in everybody's life and suddenly the spirit of God just arrested him and he was trying to bite my finger actually <laughs> in the dream I didn't see his face. I was laying hand for some reason I had this boldness and he was so vicious and looking better at me and as I was praying for him and then he fell down and he was all soaked in blood. And when he stood up, he was completely transformed and changed and began to say, this is where I'm coming from. And he was smiling. But the thing that got really interesting was Corey was standing next to me and he said, oh, dad, can I baptize him now? And I said, no, you can't do that until you yourself have not yet been baptized. <laughs> Amen. And then I just woke up. You know, and what was the verse? Was verse 7, lift up your heads. And that was what I was just saying. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, you everlasting door. And this morning, and I want to say to somebody here this morning, whatever is confronting you, whatever is resisting you, those ancient gates, Whatever the case is that is standing between you and your God-given breakthrough and destiny this morning, the power of God, I believe, is going to cause those gates to come down. And deliverance will come to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. But before then, we need to look at things in verse 6. He said, this is the generation, those who will experience the God undeniable intervention of God, the breakthrough of God, and those who have ascended unto the hills of the Lord, and to ascend unto the hills of the Lord, and he gave us the criteria this morning. But why am I not able to sustain that this morning? And this morning, that's what I want to talk about, and I've been thinking about it as I meditate on it early hours of this morning. I want to talk to you this morning about intentional faith. Your intentional faith that determines your victory. When we become intentional in our belief, in our faith, in our pursuit of righteousness, intentional when all things are going wrong, when the storm is raging against you, when nothing seems to be working, when your prayers are not being answered, when you are not getting healed instead of getting better, you're getting worse, when everything around you is crumbling down like a pack of cats, will you still be intentional in your faith and in your pursuit of God? Will you still be intentional in ascending the hills of the Lord? These are the generation, talking about the generation of men and women that are willing to make generational impact. The generation of them that seek the Lord. And this morning, I want to encourage you, like I said at the beginning, with all that is happening in the world today, that is happening to us and happening around us, are happening within us, creating a lot of chaos and questions in terms of our spirituality and our belief. And people trying to uh, represent or interpret or reinterpret the word of God, like uh, A.W. Tozer says, he said, you know, there are a lot of technical preachers today who want to uh, use techniques and other ways to interpret the Word of God and using and technical theological terms. And when they say, uh, you know, when they come in and say, oh, no, actually, the Greek, original Greek context of that word, this is what it means, it's not saying that. And they can go on and on and on with their intellectual interpretation of the Word of God. And they could be right and they could be wrong. But this morning, in spite of all those voices, are you willing to still be intentional? To be intentional is a choice. What does it mean to be intentional? It means that you are purposeful in your word and action in relation to your faith. And confession, and confession, your confession, your holy confession of faith, that which you profess. Let's say that again. To be intentional means that you are purposeful in your word and action in relation to your faith and your holy confession of faith. 
You are purposeful. You are not allowing the things around you to determine or to redefine the gospel for you. It means to live a life that is meaningful and fulfilling. First of all, to God and to your fellow man and then to yourself. That is what it means to be intentional with your faith. It means what? It secondly, it means to what? To live a life that is meaningful and fulfilling. First to God, then to your fellow man, and then what? To yourself. And that is what we call joy. Jesus first, others second, and you at the bottom plate. And so you are intentional. Living a fulfilled spiritual life without compromise. You're not thinking. This is the reason why there's so much compromise in the world today and there's so much garbage going on even within the body of Christ today. It's because of me. I put myself first. It's all about my need, what I want. But when we become intentional in our faith, we'll live first for God. We'll live second for the need of my neighbor before I begin to think of myself. When I put life in that order, I can be very intentional. It means to make thoughtful, spiritual choice in relation to your Christian faith and life at all times, at every given situation and circumstances. That is what it means to have an intentional faith. This is the one that the Bible is talking about, who shall ascend onto the hills of the Lord? It takes a man, a woman with an intention of faith to ascend because ascending requires a lot of effort. You're climbing up. You are not descending. To ascend means it takes effort. It needs a lot of effort on your side, on my part, and on your part to ascend onto the hills. Going onto the hills is an upward journey. And so if you are psychedelic in your lifestyle, you will not want to ascend because there's too much effort required, too much sacrifice required to ascend. For those people who like to go hiking, I don't. <laughs> hiking, hiking requires a lot of effort. Because most of the thing I know that I go a little part with people, there's a lot of upward motion. So if a man or a woman is not physically fit, you can't do a lot of hiking. Because it takes a lot of effort. Look at the death rates that just went by last week. It's not for children. Huh? If you can't, they train. They make a lot of sacrifice to run those ways. A lot of ascension. And so ascending onto the hills of the Lord is an intentional thing, intentional decision that requires a lot of effort and sacrifice. And if you're not willing, if you're not ready, you can. A lot of people, the reason why we quit, the Bible says when we faint in the day, when we faint in the day of adversity, that means what? Our it's strength small. is small. The, the, the effort that is required when adversity comes against you, it is not an indictment against you. It is just to train you for battle. It's just to tell you that where you are going is high up there. Amen. So when you begin to see the adversity, the attack against you as a means to give you motion and acceleration to keep climbing higher, you will have a different outlook and approach to the adversities of life. Amen. Yes, sir. Then you don't get discouraged. Paul said, even though our outward man perishes, he said, our inward man is being renewed day by day. To be intentional means to be spiritually intentional. Actively 
engaging your life to be spiritually engaging to spiritually engage your life you walk with the holy spirit not with your own eyes not with your own understanding the bible said lean not unto your own understanding but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path a man or woman of faith who's intentional about your faith they intentionally engage the holy spirit on all matters relating to the scripture for their absolute guide and direction. Are you intentional that way? To be intentional also means to be very consistent in your walk, your walk with the Lord. And like I always say, if your work, W-A-L-K, right? If that is right with God, your work has to do with your character, your nature, and who you are, who they know you to be. Huh? Your work speaks about the man or the woman you are at home. The one when I call your children by the corner and I say, who is mommy at home with daddy? And you know what I mean? That is who you are. It's not the one you are in church. Amen. You can praise the Lord and lift up fingers in church and I can prophesy in the church this morning and I can preach this morning as I am. This is not me. And I pray it is. Amen. <laughs> the real me is the one that my wife and my children know. And if that one, the one they know at home, if it is not coordinating with the one standing here this morning, then my work is not right. Do you get my point now? And so, so no matter what I do, so even if I came to church this morning and cleaned the foyer and sweep the church and vacuum everywhere and put up the seats and do everything, that is my work. That is inconsequential. That may be praised by men. I may come in here and sing like a bird this morning and everybody will say, what a wonderful singer you are. If that... Is what I do here does not coordinate with the one at home at 9 p.m. tonight, then what I did here this morning is useless. Do you get my point now? This is it. And so when a man who is intentional in their faith, I'm saying that to say that you are what? You become a consistent man or a woman with your work and your work. Both of them coordinate well. You are consistent in your belief and in your actions. So the man you were 10 years ago is the same man you are today. When people see you, they see an improved version. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you say, have you seen people? And I've seen people, even in the last 10 years, I've seen people who were very hot here 10 years ago, literally speaking. And today, what they were at home began to what? Show up. And this one became non consequential. And then we look and say, oh, wow, that man used to prophesy in church. He used to be a pastor. What happened to him? Because it was never intentional in their belief and in their work with God. Are you intentional? And when trials and tribulations come against you and me, it's trying to shake you from being consistent. The first thing you must always remember, as I encourage you this morning, God will bless you, wonderful, that is true. But one thing I want you to know, child of God, anytime when you begin to look at trials and tribulations through the eyes of the Spirit, whatever the enemy throws at you, be it against your marriage, your health, your finances, and anything that you can think of, he wants to change your testimony to see how consistent you will be, even in spite of that. Yes, Do you remember the story of Job? What did the wife say to him? He said, 
Are you still going to keep your integrity? Why don't you curse God now and just die and be done with it? And, and, and are you still going to keep believing God even though you're going to die in three months? Are you still going to be faithful in this place, in this relationship, even after all they've done to you? Are you still going to be believing God and still going to church even after you prayed and your son or your daughter is still on the street? Are you still going to stay God? Are you still going to be consistent? Inspired? Are you still going to stay believe God? Are you going to keep believing God? Even when you lost your job, you came to church and gave all your money, you know what I mean? Like the sister was saying just now. You know, and then I had that testimony and I go give all my money. And then the next day when I walk into my work, and, my, and then they gave me a letter and said, okay, thank you for working with us, your service is no longer needed. But I thought going to church and giving to God was going to be my promotion. Why is this? Are you still going to be consistent? Are you still going to be intentional with your faith? I was thinking about my life recently, even this morning while I was praying about this, and I remember thinking about Gildas and Cheryl Sharon. And I remember when I started Early in the 90s, in the 90s in Zaria, in northern Nigeria, with those kids in the classroom. And, and, I, I, and I remember vividly one or two men, and I can see their faces. And one day, I only had a, like a bunk bed mattress. That's what I had in my room. It was a two bedroom, I wasn't married yet. And it's a true life story. And I had this bunk bed mattress on the floor in the room. That's all I had for. All my wealth and everything I had was there, and the little clothes I had hanging. And uh, I traveled, and before I came back, somebody who needed that more than me broke into the house and took that. <laughs> and, and I'm like, Lord, you know, it's as if it's never ending story. And I went sourcing for money for the children of my school, and I wanted to buy them a play thing. And I remember I needed a bed, I needed something to sleep in, and I was still going to go ahead to do this. And I, I remember a pastor in particular, he said, how can you be so stupid? Why would you do that? Why don't you use this money to take care of yourself? You did that. That was a genuine concern, right? But I said, no, as God is my witness, I need to do this. I did that, and I kept doing that. But what am I saying? When I look back, to over 20 something years ago of my life, I've been, to the glory of God, I've been consistent when it comes to the call of God and the instruction of God for my life and ministry. Amen. And I can boldly, humbly say that. Amen. I say that without mindset work, that it, because it's not something you start today. It is through trials and tribulation when the enemy comes like a flood. The Bible said the Spirit of God will raise up a standard. When you stay consistent, when you train your hands for battle, is when life is the most difficult for you and you choose to obey God in love and in honor and in truth. And that is when your spiritual muscles are trained. Amen. And that is when you become strong. Yes, and that is when the prince of this world can come and have nothing in you. Yes, sir. You don't train for battle when everything is fine. The days of trials and tribulation is not the time for you and me to sit back and grieve and mourn. You can cry but pick up yourself and fight through it. Be intentional with your faith in the days of battle. Amen. And as I think about those days and I think about the days of lack and want and I was pushing through with those kids and just doing things. Most of the kids that went through my head, some of them are doctors today. Some of them are living well, married, and, and I can say, both listen with all humility to God. I'm a grandfather to a large extent. I have so many kids. You can see the result. But the point of the matter, the story is this. Staying intentional with your faith when things are tough.
And so number one, quickly you can write this down. So being intentional means you must be purposeful in your walk with the Lord. The purpose there is the purpose of God for your life. The purpose you are to weigh your need, your situation. The purpose of God should have to leave, uh, because purpose will always uh, leave your crisis and your tribulation. The Bible says it is, and we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. When you, when, to be intentional is to stay focused in spite of whatever you're going through, with the purpose of God for your life, the blueprint of God for your life, what has God told you about your life in spite of what you're going through? Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 9 said, Who hath saved us and has called us with an holy calling, not according to our, our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So God is more interested in his purpose for your life than just your service that has no purpose, no meaning, no direction. Are you allowing the crisis you're going through right now to shift you away from the purpose of God for your life? Or are you still intentional with your faith? Are you aligning what you're going through, the troubles and the tribulations and the trials and the temptation to shift you away from the purpose of God for your life? Are you getting too busy for the purpose of God for your life? Being intentional means we must be deliberate in our conduct as Christians. We must be deliberate in our conduct. Philippians chapter 1 verse 27 says, Whatever happened, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. To be intentional with your faith, you must be deliberate. You. you don't need to compromise the standard of God because one sneaky preacher told you that it's okay. And the word deliberate and to deliberate, they, they spell the same way, right? One is to talk about it, the other one is to what? Act it out. And so you must be deliberate in talking about it, and you must deliberate it with other people with confidence, and must be deliberate in the way you carry it out. That is how to be intentional. To be intentional with our faith, with your faith, means to be uncompromising in your obedience to God and His Word. It's not a coerced obedience. It's not a manipulative obedience. It's obedience that is formed from what? From the platform of love. To manipulate you to love God is the greatest disservice anybody can do to you. And to threaten you to love God is the worst that anybody... You can't threaten me to love God. Don't threaten people with hell before they can love God. Mm -hmm. Amen, yes, sir. Love is a choice. Mm -hmm. Don't coerce people. Don't manipulate people. Love God and he's going to bless you with $10 million. And they've been waiting for 10 years and it has not come. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> no. Tell them Deliberate it to them. Tell them about the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, the righteousness of God, and let them make a choice whether they will follow God or not. By the way you live your life, deliberately conducting yourself in a manner worthy of the same gospel that you have shared. And people will want to see that. Yes. And how do you do that? You become intentional about who you are and whose you are. Who you are in Christ and who you belong to. Paul said so. He said what? <clears throat> there stood before me the night, the angel of God, whose I am and who I serve. And to be an intentional Christian with our faith 
we must be intentional also about our forgiveness. We must learn to forgive. We must be intentional in forgiving. We must be intentional in forgiving. We must be intentional in letting go. We must be intentional about letting go. We must be intentional about forgiving. We must be intentional about letting go of the past. Two things together. One, we must learn to forgive. Jesus said, forgive those who trespass against us, even as we want God to forgive us. And secondly, this is, and I can rest here and I will take a communion and we'll pray. Listen, you must also be very intentional about letting go of the past. Some of us are prisoners of our past. Some of us are prisoners of past mistakes. We are prisoners of past failures. We are prisoners of past defeat. We've allowed ourselves to become prisoners of yesterday. And because we stay in the prison house of yesterday, we are not able to experience the fullness of God's glory and joy in our lives. Isaiah 43 verse 18 says, and that is verse 19 is what you have on the wall. Remember ye not the former things. Right? Remember ye not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Be intentional about forgetting the mistakes of the past. Paul speaking to us in Philippians chapter 3. He said, one thing I do, Forgetting those things that are behind me. Some of us are in the prison house of the mistakes of yesterday, of the words that were spoken to us five years ago, of the mistakes we made 20 years ago, of the words that were spoken to us by somebody who was in our lives. Some of them are dead and long gone, but we are still in the past. Some of us are dwelling in the past mistakes of yesterday. And the Lord is saying, be intentional as a child of God to let go of the past. Remember not the former things. Behold, I do a new thing. Can't you see it? I'm making a way in the wilderness. Courage, can you put uh, Isaiah 43 verse 17 to 20 for me all together in King James and let's do this and take a communion. We're going to pray this morning. And I just want to show you this, that one of the great things, this is where I believe that I wanted to pray about, and this is where I want to rest to pray for this morning. As we pray this morning and take our communion and believe God for a visitation, Isaiah 43. Jesus. We bring it for the chariots and the house and the army and the power that they shall lie down together, they shall not rise, they are esteemed, they are quenched as told. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing, and it shall spring forth, shall you not see it? I will even make a way in the wilderness. This is how we tie it this morning. Psalm 24, you said what? O ye gates, you ancient doors, former things, old things. Most of the gates in our lives are our past mistakes, past issues. 
That's what the Bible called it, Asian doors. The past crisis in our life, the things that happened to you 20 years ago, five years ago, six months ago, have become a gate. And it's stopping you from moving forward into your God-given destiny. You say, all ye gates without lift head up. You everlasting doors, you Asian doors. I interpret it that way. And now he says again, forget about the former things. Because if you don't let go of yesterday, what I'm about to do, you will not see it. He said, I'm making a way in the wilderness. Can you not see? That means God has already started something new in your life. But because you are still holding on to the past, you can't see it. You can't see it. You can't see it because you're holding on to the past. He says, well, look at it there. I will make rivers in the desert. Let's put verse 19 back to us as we pray this morning. Just verse 19 of 43 there. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? It will spring forth. Will you not know it? But if you don't let go, and I'll speak to you by the Spirit of God this morning. Again, I don't know who you are. The Lord is saying, be intentional about letting go of your past. Because something new has already started, but because you are holding on to that yesterday, you are not able to see it. God is already making a way for you where there seems to be no way, but you cannot see it. You don't see it. This morning, we are going to pray. We're going to take our communion, and for those who have to go after that, good and fine. But if you just want me, I'm going to spend time after that. I want to take time to pray for as many as want to stay behind. I want to pray with you, not just for you. I want to pray with you, believing God for a supernatural manifestation of his finger, that invisible finger of God. To show up on your behalf this morning, setting you free from yesterday and bringing you into that newness. Just like the man that I saw this morning, who from that dirty path was transformed before my very eye into a brand new man, filled with the glory of God that is unimaginable. <coughs> Coming out from this dirty Shrine that he was sitting down there all broken and battered when he stood up and coming to attack and the power of God seized him. Forgetting the past, doing a new thing. Shall we stand up this morning? I want you to pray. That as we take this communion together this morning, that the Holy Spirit will touch you, will bring healing, will bring comfort, will bring restoration. I want you to pray this morning, asking the Lord to help you to forget the past. And that is why I want to hang my heart this morning. And I feel so strongly about that this morning morning. Everything I said late to this. Forget about yesterday. Literally, forget about last year. Forget about the mistakes of the past. Whatever the enemy is using to cage you down, to limit you, to stop you from making the next move, God is saying, I've already started a new chapter in your life. Let it go. 
you are hanging on to some relationship that need to go. And God is saying, let it go because I'm doing a new thing. And holding on to this is blinding you spiritually from seeing the next move of God that already started long time ago. That business, the Holy Spirit is saying, don't try to resurrect or resuscitate. Don't give life to what God is killing. I make bold to say that right now. Don't try to resuscitate what God has already put the plug off. Look into the new thing that God is doing in your life. Can the ushers come and help me this morning? Please. Jesus. Father, we give you praise. I just want you to stretch forth your hand towards me before you sit down, before the ushers pass it around. Just stretch forth your hand towards this as a point of contact. We're doing things. I don't understand it, but I believe. For the Bible said that night, the night before he was betrayed, not after. And so what Jesus, this is has nothing to do with any man. This is not a church ordinance. This is Jesus' divine instruction. He said the night before he was betrayed. And so to confirm the scripture that says he was crucified before the foundation of the world. And so what we are doing when we come together, we are entering into a spiritual stronghold that the enemy does not have the password into. The night before he was betrayed, not before, not after, before he went to the cross, he settled the issue of our destiny long before the foundation of the world. Lord, you took the bread and you broke it. Father God, because your body was broken, ours is meant to be mended. For every broken heart here this morning, we pray for a mending. For every broken boat this morning, we pray for a mending. For every broken business, we pray for a mending. For every broken life, tattered. May your broken body translate into the mending of that broken life standing before you this morning. Lord, we use this communion table as a point of contact to usher us into the next level of grace, mercy, righteousness. In the name of Jesus. And you took the bread of the wine. You said, this is the new covenant in thy blood. The blood that speaks better things than the blood of Abel. May the voice of the blood of Jesus speak for you where you cannot speak. Anything that they have said to you that has caused you to feel low about yourself. Any voice that has spoken low self-esteem into your DNA. Rejection. Today, through the voice of the blood. Receive a better testimony concerning your life, even today in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. There is power, power, power.